Uh, welcome to Parallax Views, an IEA series of conversations about cultural affairs, ideology, uh, specifically focusing on the issue of freedom of speech. My name is Mark Glendenning, and today um, I'm being joined by the historian Nigel Jones, and we'll be discussing fascism, past, present, and future, question mark. Um, recently, two books have uh, been published by left-wing authors, Paul Mason and Laurie Penny, asserting that fascism is on the march uh, in Britain. Uh, terms like fascist, far-right, alt-right, white supremacist, and so on, are commonly directed at individuals from a conservative, classical, liberal, and even social democratic uh, background. And so I thought from a liberal perspective, it would be interesting uh, to examine this question. Um, I would assert um, that there is a, a growing authoritarianism in Britain, uh, but it's emanating primarily from what might be described as the new left, or the culture control left, as I put it, um, of politics. But is it going too far to say uh, that this is actually a proto-fascistic uh, movement in the making. I haven't got time to list um, all of Nigel's uh, great accomplishments and areas of activity, uh, but most relevant to the discussion we're about to have, he is uh, one of his many biographies, is that of the British fascist leader and one-time Labour politician, Oswald Mosley, as well as a study of the, uh, the Freikorps in Germany. Politically speaking, uh, Nigel has a very interesting history, uh, a former Maoist activist in Germany, <laughs> and then UKIP candidate uh, for Eastbourne in 2015. And we're going to kick off with Nigel giving us a description of the, the origins of fascism before we come on to discuss specific questions more relevant to the situation we face in Britain. So over to you, Nigel. Fascism today has become a meaningless um, smear word, really. It's applied to characters uh, ranging from uh, um, Boris Johnson, absurdly, because a more unfascist person than Boris you, could, you, you, you couldn't possibly imagine, to members of the royal family and indeed to anyone that the, the far left disagrees with. So just to narrow it down to what the word actually means and its origins, it's derived from the Italian word fascio, meaning bundle, because um, the first fascist movement to come to power in a country which was the fascist movement uh, led by Benito Mussolini, the Duce of fascism in Italy, their symbol was the ancient Roman one of a bundle of sticks or rods surrounding an axe. Now this used to be carried in the Roman Empire before the Roman magistrates when they went in ceremonial pr uh, processions and it symbolized the authority of the state to, com to, 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 to um, commit corporal punishment, hence the canes, and capital punishment, hence the axe. It also came to mean a unity, a binding together, a fellowship. So the first fascist movement, which was founded in Milano in um, March 1919, um, they called themselves the Fatti de Combattimento, which means um, fighting associations is the nearest very bad English translation. And this consisted, this, this movement, of um, a mixed bag of great war veterans like Mussolini himself, uh, intellectuals and artists, for example, the futurist movement in the arts, were very, very fascist minded. They saw themselves as representing the 20th century age of... Sort speech. of people like Marinetti. And Marinetti yeah. Yeah. was in the movement from first to last. He, he remained in it forever, the leader of the futurists. So they were a strange um, mixed bag and their primary aims were 
um, militarism and nationalism, uh, restoring the Roman Empire to a certain extent, and modernizing um, Italian politics. And they had what we would now probably regard as left-wing aspects. They wanted to lower the voting age to 18. They wanted to give women the vote. They didn't have the vote at, at the time. They wanted to abolish the Italian monarchy. And they wanted to promote workers to um, run uh, factories uh, in, in alliance with the management. So they had a lot of left-wing ideas. And historians of fascism um, are still today divided about whether it was as Marxists say, the last gasp of, a, of, 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 of capitalism before it collapses into revolution, or was it actually a variant of socialism itself, a national socialist movement? Because what is uh, common to almost all fascist movements in whatever country they arose is nationalism. Um, so, I mean, deviating slightly, of course, a lot of fascists in the interwar period um, became pan-European nationalists. I mean, they had this, both Hitler, Mussolini, Petain, they had this dream, didn't they, of a united Europe that was became, and, and Mosley, of course, who continued campaigning for a united Europe into indeed. the post-war period. Absolutely. So that became also a theme, was sort of yes, pro-European. That, that was a sort of uber-nationalism. They, they, yes. they saw Europe as a constant, particularly, for example, in competition with um, uh, former colonial uh, in Africa, the former uh, countries ruled by European countries, they saw a white Europe as, to a certain extent, in competition and, and, and in hostile relationship to, to uh, what they regarded as um, lesser races. Right. Um, now, obviously, the, the atmospherics today um, are very, very different mm -hmm. from, you know, Europe in the 1930s and 40s. That might be considered very shrill mm. uh, and overblown to suggest that there is uh, that we are moving in a sort of fascistic direction. However, from a specifically classical liberal perspective, there are several red flags, or perhaps we should call them mm. black flags, uh, that we should, I think, be concerned about. And so um, I'm going to ask you about these uh, in sequence. The, the yeah. first one is there is clearly a sort of anti-democratic or anti-liberal democratic um, atmosphere at the moment, I mean, particularly emanating from the new left, yeah. not the old left, which is a very different uh, uh, Beast, but certainly if you look at cancel culture, uh, the desire to actually drive people out of employment who hold uh, the wrong mm. views. Mm. If we look at say Extinction Rebellion, Black Lives Matter, uh, these are organisations that have overtly said they're anti. Uh, uh, liberal democracy and give themselves the rights to a bit like the Italian fascistic squadristi to just take over mm. uh, towns, uh, remove monuments, commit acts of 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 violence. Uh, we saw it, I think, to some extent with the you know the campaign to reverse a democratic result in, in terms of the Brexit uh, yeah. referendum, the Lib Dem, you know, bollocks to Brexit campaign and, and, and all of that. So, I mean, do you agree that there is a an anti-democratic vibe in the culture which could become at some point in the future something more significant than it is now? Yes, I think there's been a definite step change on the left. Uh, in an anti-democratic direction, because one of the characteristics of fascism is it had no truck, uh, and indeed it was absolutely proud of espousing violence. That was one, it, worship of violence was one, was one of the pillars of fascism. The reason that Mussolini came to power uh, within three and a half years of that initial meeting uh, was that his squadristi, as you said, his his, his action squads fanned out across northern Italy burning uh, the headquarters, the newspapers of, of, of the uh, mainly socialist opponents uh, and beating them up. One of their um, characteristic punishments, they made them drink castor oil so that they soiled themselves. So that was very humiliating as well as very unpleasant and painful. So they worship violence. There was absolutely no doubt about that. And the left today 
doesn't make um, um, any bones about doing precisely the same thing. I mean, violence at the moment is largely verbal, shouting down speakers with inconvenient views when they go to universities, for example, or pulling down statues and chucking them in, in the docks at Bristol or, or wherever. It's uh, that, or throwing red paint over the Margaret Thatcher's statue in Grantham, that sort of thing. But you can see it's only a very, very small step to uh, actual physical violence. They are really verging in the direction, in that sense, of fascism, I would say. Um, another theme that I think we should explore in this uh, context is, of course, identity politics. Yeah. Um, so, uh, a, a politics that seeks to allocate rights and indeed punishments on the basis of qualities, characteristics that are abstracted from individual human beings. The, the, the whole um, essence of liberalism is that individuals uh, should be the basic unit of social analysis mm. and the basis uh, of legal, equal legal mm -hmm. rights. What seems to be happening with the new left is a movement towards something that's almost analogous to the Chinese social credit system, whereby people are allocated uh, rights and punishments on the basis of what they call intersectionality. Mm -hmm. um, and so th this is leading incrementally towards a political and legal system in which, in reality, people have different types of rights. Hence, you've got the whole um, concept of protected characteristics. So we're seeing the beginnings of a movement, I would suggest, um, in Britain um, towards a, a society which is not really predicated upon a respect for the individual, but sees society very much like the fascists did through the prism of identity groups. Yeah, uh, and I think this is where fascism and Marxism met. That Marxism as well in, in, in old style communist societies like, like Russia and today like, like China sees people not as individuals but as groups. And in fascism they also tried to divide the community into groups. There were guilds, the, uh, in, they wanted to replace the trade unions um, with, uh, as, I, as I said, with what the Germans call Mitbestimmung, with work as councils, running factories, and there was the worship above all of the state and the mass in the state. And that idea is common to both uh, communist Marxist uh, societies and fascist societies. So it is, if you like, the war against the individual that is common to both of them. And, and, I, and I think um, the, the left is now moving again as they're moving towards violence. They are moving towards a denigration of the individual and yet a division of society into identi uh, uh, identifiable groups into, in, by identities, whether they're trans, whether they're racial groups, uh, whether they're class groups, um, by which it's easier to divide and to set such groups against each other. Yes, and so suppose the, 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 the end result of all this um, intersectional uh, way of looking at society is that ultimately the state becomes the centralized arbiter mm -hmm. of the allocation of rewards uh, and and punishments. Yes. Um, and so th there's also an echo, I mean, going back to what you, you've just been saying, um, concerning the, the, the sort of fascist idea of the corporate state, yes. whereby people would not be represented within the state uh, through uh, their own individual political expression, mm -hmm. f through voting for members of parliament on a geographical basis, but they would be represented through the groups yes. that the state had itself 
constructed theoretically, uh, and so you would have this idea of the corporate state, exactly. where you have groups, group representation, uh, and the state sitting above the groups and imposing some sort of unity. Yeah, going back to the bundle of rods and all that. Yes. Um, I think when you look at the history of fascism, um, quite often they did actually cooperate with their ostensible Marxist opponents. For example, under the Weimar Republic, the Nazis and the communists were always battling each other in the streets. Uh, although they did have a lot in common, you know, Nazis became communists and communists became Nazis. They, there was quite a lot of interchange between the, the, the groups. Um, they did cooperate in, in, in strikes. And there was also intellectual, in the early days of the movement, there was intellectual cooperation. There was a, a French intellectual called Georges Sorel, who wrote a very influential book in the first decade of the, um, of the 20th century called Reflections on Violence in which he, he, like the fascists, he uh, said that violence is a great thing. He wanted to use it to empower trade unions. He was a Marxist. But for a very short while, he cooperated with a, a proto-fascist movement in France called Action, Action Française, which a lot of historians pinpoint as the first actual fascist movement in, in Europe, um, um, arising in France rather than Italy. So um, there was a lot of uh, uh, interchange between the two, the twin totalitarian movements that dominated the 20th century, Marxist communism and fascism, fascism, Nazism, if, if you like, on the other hand. And what they had in common uh, uh, was probably more uh, significant than what divided them. If you look at a, at a, at a fascist or a communist film uh, uh, of the marching parades, the worship of the leader, uh, the militarism, the all There's a lot of homoeroticism. Oh, there's certainly, there's certainly a lot of that. <laughs> there's a lot of Nuremberg but, rallies and all this kind of stuff. Yeah, but uh, also yeah. W w women are, uh, are used uh, uh, as well as men, but mm. very, very frequently divided. You, know, yeah. you don't get them mingling too much. Yeah, I mean, somebody... Uh, who, uh, it's interesting, uh, moving on from your comments about Georges Sorel, yeah. um, is the German uh, philosopher of jurisprudence, Karl Schmitt, yeah. who actually some on the new left uh, now favorably refer to because of his theory of enemies and friends. Mm -hmm. And so he argued, just like the new left does, that the, the, the state cannot be neutral. Um, it, yeah. it cannot be a, a zone, a space within which all individuals are accorded the same rights to um, freedom of political expression. Yes. Because there are groups within the society who are enemies of the state. And some on the new left rather like this because, of course, they identify the patriarchy, uh, white supremacy, heteronormativity, <laughs> uh, and, and so on and so on. Uh, people associated with those ideological constructions that they have developed, they associate them as being internal enemies and oppressors. Uh, and so it seems to me there's a parallel here. Again, going back to, the, uh, there's a, even though the groups they've identified as enemies and friends may be different, yeah. um, nevertheless, from a liberal perspective, that's kind of irrelevant because we're about individual liberty. Yeah. And so we don't really care uh, in whose name we're being oppressed. But it seems to me there's a parallel here between the theories of Carl Schmitt yes. and uh, some of the new left uh, uh, way of looking at society. Yeah. Um, it's significant that um, um, fascist philosophers, and there were such, although, although that sounds contradictory because one of the tenets of fascism was uh, that they uh, worshipped emotion rather than thought. They were against Again, thought. very much like the New Left. Yeah. Exactly. They were against the Enlightenment. They were against bourgeois values like, like freedom of speech and freedom of thought. Uh, and, they, and, they, and they worshipped the emotion above that. And uh, fascist philosophers like Martin Heidegger, who was um, a, a member of the Nazi party, like Schmidt himself, who you refer to, the great jurist and, and um, um, lawgiver of, 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 of Nazism, and um, indeed uh, the founder of Action Francaise, Charles Moir, came to prominence during the Dreyfus Affair, which was an anti-Semitic outburst in France, a Jewish 
officer was wrongly convicted of spying uh, for the Germans. And when it became clear that he was innocent, Mora, Charles Mora, the founder of Action Francaise, said, yes, OK, he's guilty. Uh, sorry, he's innocent, but it's more important that the state is preserved, that the reputation of the army is preserved, than the reputation of this Jew who's on Devil's Island is preserved. So let him rot on Desert Island as long as the uh, uh, reputation of the army and the state remain sacrosanct. Yes. Um, it's interesting, is it not, also, um, you mentioned Martin Heidegger, yeah. that there is a thread... Um, that goes from him, yeah. uh, and indeed Nietzsche, who some people argue is the first kind of postmodernist, through to the French postmodernists of the 60s and 70s. Derrida and so forth. Yes, and who, people yeah. coming from yeah. a, uh, a Marxian background, yeah. but who abandoned classical Marxist mm -hmm. theory, um, who became um, uh, the leading lights of the French new left, and who made overt reference to their debt to both Nietzsche uh, and Heidegger. Yeah. Very well captured in a book by uh, Richard Wolin called The Seduction of Unreason, yeah. which is about the connections between fascistic thought and uh, the French and American new lefts of the post-war period. So postmodernism, it seems to me, is a very key connecting theme mm -hmm. between um, fascism uh, and, and certain types of left-wing politics. Which brings me on to my last question um, about language and power. Yeah. Um, and, and, and this is where postmodernism, I think, uh, is uh, hugely relevant to what we're discussing. Because the French postmodernists um, argued that language was a technique of power. Mm. It wasn't just the means by which individuals can peacefully uh, exchange ideas mm -hmm. and, and argue with you, um, with each other. It's, it's a way in which the groups that have been defined as oppressor groups um, y can exercise control over the society. And the new left very much in Britain and America today are totally in accord with this idea, hence their obsession about preventing debate. I mean, let me give you a quote here yeah. uh, from a Labour MP, um, and she says, we must not fetishise debate as though debate is itself an innocuous neutral act. The very act of debate is an effective rollback of assumed equality and a foot in the door for doubt and hatred. So the implication of that is that it's okay to censor, to prohibit anybody who holds a view that from a new left perspective would be considered in some way uh, oppressive mm -hmm. or goes, is transgressive of um, the way in which they think. So we see this particularly as of this moment with the transgender yeah. question, whereby the police are turning up uh, at people's doors because of um, yeah. exchanges they've, they've had on the internet, say, about transgenderism. Um, they're being placed on police databases which have no legal uh, basis, as it so happens. Uh, there are campaigns to stop J.K. Rowling from, you know, getting her books published and so on and yeah, yeah. so on. Um, so, you see, once you adhere to that thought, it seems to me that there's a dynamic there, a, a logic which takes you towards an anti-liberal democratic position by definition. If, if forms of, some forms of speech are defined as being oppressive, well, why shouldn't mm. the state just <laughs> erase them? I, I tend to believe in, um, you know, that theory that if a butterfly waves its wings, it causes an earthquake on the other side of the, of the world. I tend to sort of go along with that, and I'm... I'm That's very I'm, new age of you. I'm, but, uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm not saying I agree with that, but anyway, yeah. But, um, <laughs> but I tend to think that Western society at the moment is on the, is on the cusp of what, what I would call a Puritan revolution. 
And I think one of the major aspects of this, is its, uh, which fascism and communism had in common, is its lack of humour. It doesn't like jokes. It takes itself incredibly seriously. You can't snigger. And you see it today uh, that, that, you know, a- anyone who makes what used to be called an off-colour jokes is liable to get slated. And I think there's a great... Uh, a, a, a movement against eroticism and sex, I think we're on the verge of a Puritan counter-revolution. And I think one reason that fascism historically did not prosper in Britain, you mentioned my biography of Mosley, that, that was the nearest that we, that we came to having an open fascist movement in Britain, but never got popular enough to elect a single MP, whereas Europe was, European countries were falling like nine pins to, to, to fascism all over the place. It's, it's one of the divisions between Britain and continental Europe that I think under, under um, pinned Brexit uh, is uh, that we don't take uh, these, we tend to sneer and snigger at people who take themselves too seriously and fascism totally lacks humour, totally lacks nuance and they, were, and, and they uh, wish to imprison thought in a sort of concrete carapace and channel it into um, the desired channels. But the big question is then, who guards the guardians? Who sets the rules and who makes the rules and who makes sure that those rules stay in place? That's what we should question. Who are the people behind the movement of the police to, to censor the internet, for example. Mm. Who, 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 who is doing that? Who are the people behind it? And I think what the right, what, what conservatives, their task at the moment is actually to um, fight the, the counter-revolution, if you like, against this vast movement towards uh, totalitarian thought that is definitely, without question, I think, on the rise all over the West, but particularly in the Anglo-American sphere. Yeah, Uh, but I would, as a rider to that, say I don't think it's just uh, conservatives who need to (laughs) fight this. Uh, uh, It's it's, it's, it's political liberals of all types, and that includes, of course, good uh, social democrats um, who who are equally in favour of free speech. Uh, But that is an interesting note on which to end this conversation. Um, Thank you so much, Nigel, for taking the time to be with us. Thank you for inviting me. And um, uh, thank you for watching. Well, if you enjoyed that conversation, why not watch one of these other videos? And while you're here, remember to hit the subscribe button and the notification bell. That way, you'll never miss out on a single IEA broadcast.